with your announcements. Uh, I'm sorry I had to miss last Thursday's class. Now, in order to, uh, not to, uh, so there was, everybody didn't get the message as far as I understand. And I told the office upstairs to send to all physics students, but they interpreted it some very narrowly, like only first year MSc, post MSc, or second year something. So that is not what I told. Anyway, I have a solution. So I have started a Google SMS news channel and uh, the details are up on my web page and all you have to do is subscribe to it with your mobile phones and then whenever there is a class uh, delay or cancellation or change of timing, you will get an SMS. Okay? So please go to the website. Uh, in case anybody went to the website already and signed up, they will have to do it again because I had by mistake made a public channel but I have changed it to a private channel which uh, means I can keep track of who is subscribed to it. So uh, that's one way if you want, uh, if, you, if you're not able to subscribe to that and it's all free obviously, if you're not able to do that and you want some other way of notification you can tell me but this is the easiest for me because I can send out a short message and everyone will be so that's one announcement. Second is that uh, on the coming Thursday, day after tomorrow, there is a public lecture and I think that is here. In any case, it's at 4 o'clock. I think it's here. Ajay, you also said it. It's an auditorium. Is it? But you said this room is booked. Equipment. Huh? Equipment. 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 Not the room. Okay, but still it's a public lecture. Maybe people want to go for it. Huh? huh? So I don't mind looking for an alternate time and place, but somebody should suggest what it should be. Maybe Friday would be good. Friday would suit me quite well. What are people's constraints for Friday? Friday. Lab. Lab. But that's every day. Right? No. So when is that for us? For us too. I shall please discuss now and come to some suggestion and then uh, I will try. I still have to find a place and all that. But in the meanwhile, for those who just came in. Ajay also please subscribe to this. Yeah. Okay, so have we got a date on Friday? Uh, time on Friday for the lecture? MSc first year is a problem. MSc first year. Who are MSc first year there? And the problem is? Uh, Scheduled on that day. Scheduled on that day from what time to what time? 2 to 6. 2 to 6. I see. Uh, what about the mornings? Mornings are bad for everybody. Yeah. Well, I don't want to cancel another class now. I mean, then uh, you will never be getting anywhere. Moreover, next week is when Nitin Nitsure has, is going to give you at least one and maybe two lectures on. Uh, so, maybe uh, if course. most of us are interested in having the class, why don't we have the class on Thursday? Thursday at yeah. 4 p.m. during the public. Okay, this camera is not available, but that I find uh, not the most important reason. But what is the view? I mean, actually, I feel like Sam Petrosa. Thursday 2 p.m. Thursday 2 p.m. Thursday 2 p.m. Thursday 2 p.m. Ah, very good. 
one of the four coordinates is time and the other three are space. You can mix them up in many ways, but finally there should be one time coordinate. There should not be no time coordinate and there should also not be two time coordinates. That should really be exactly one. Okay. So slight change is uh, to accommodate space time. Good. So this was a sort of general discussion that we had last time. And this time what I want to do Okay, and so I proved to you that you can do all these things. This time, I want to really get away from this uh, spatial geometry and work only with space time, or almost exclusively with space time. And today, I want to highlight the aspects which have to do with space time. So earlier I was highlighting aspects which are common between space and space time, between curved space and curved space time. Today I want to highlight those in which the time plays some sort of role. Okay. So for that we'll start with the following thing. Let's recall what we did right in the beginning of this course. That the action we defined for a point particle moving in a curved space was this and from it the geodesic equation of motion sorry the Lagrange Lagrangian equation of or Euler Lagrange equation of motion uh, came out to be x double dot i plus gamma i k <coughs> x dot j, x dot k equals 0. So this is the equation we hopped on a lot and this is the geodesic equation. Now it's easy to guess from this structure that in space time the geodesic equation should be the same one with i j k replaced by mu nu lambda indices which go over 0, 1, 2, 3. But it's only a guess. I didn't write any Lagrangian. extension to go from this equation to this equation. In fact, while this equation essentially has no puzzles in it, it's just an equation for how a particle would propagate on a curved space. So if the particle is stuck on the surface of some sphere or some deformed kind of space and we know the metric of that space, then this equation tells us how that particle propagates. Xi with i going from 1 to 3 are the space coordinates and the dot is with respect to time and space and time are absolute and there is no confusion. Here on the other hand, looking at this equation potentially there is a lot of confusion because mu goes over 0, 1, 2, 3 so x naught is the time. Okay, If x naught is the time then what is this dot with respect to? It is with respect to something else. Okay, That is some parameter which is which it labels the point on the world line of the particle. So what is that parameter? Can we choose it as we like? Okay. So this is a bunch of queries and they are very fundamental to the structure of uh, space time and general relativity. So we need to address those queries. So, so the query is, so the comment is that x mu is t x y z or x naught x1 x2 x3 so what is x new dot so the answer we'd like to propose is that x mu dot means the x mu by the tau where tau is some parameter <coughs> along the world line. But 
this in turn puts us in more trouble because if it's some parameter, then how do I know that my parameter and your parameter will be equally good? Okay. For both of them to be equally good, it should be possible in principle for me to choose any parameter I feel like and somehow have the equation still be true. But is that really the case? In other words, if I take this equation and change tau to some other function, tau prime of tau, will this equation be invariant? And the answer is actually no. In fact, you can see a very trivial case of it. Equation <coughs> is not invariant. equation, the proposed geodesic equation, this one. Okay. The simplest way to see that is just consider a trivial example. What's a trivial example of a space-time? Minkowski space-time. The metric is just eta. Then gamma is actually zero everywhere. Then the equation is x double dot mu equals zero. This equation is not invariant under changes of tau going to an arbitrary function factor and tau prime of tau. You can try it for yourself. First of all, when we make such a change, we should say what we want the coordinates to do. The coordinates of course should not change. They should continue to be the same coordinates at the same point. Which means in practice that x prime mu of tau prime is x mu of tau. It's rather curious, this reminds us of a general coordinate transformation where we are transforming a coordinate on the world line, not the coordinate of space. Okay? And this is the law of transformation of a scalar under this particular kind of general coordinate transformation, saying that it doesn't change. It's different and it has a completely different meaning from general coordinate transformations in space time. Okay? But this is also required because we are refusing to say what parameter tau is the one for which that equation is true. And we don't want to say it because we will be very happy if that equation could be true for all possible parameters tau. And it's a little bit subtle and complicated but we are going to do, do it now and see how this works out. So this equation is not invariant. The second question you could ask is what Lagrangian does that equation come from analogous to the equation above for the case of space? Okay. And then we immediately start to see the root of the problem. Um, <coughs> and then the solution presents itself. A possible Lagrangian might be, but it's not actually, S equals integral, uh, always write S equals integral dt or d tau times L, L is the Lagrangian, S is the action. And let's guess that it is z mu nu x dot mu, x dot mu. Now here you have it. You can see that this is not invariant under transformations tau goes to tau, tau prime of tau because this gives me a single Jacobian factor, dt by d tau. And this gives me two Jacobian factors, one for each of these. Is that clear? The extra factor, if I transform, let's do it. D tau prime is D tau prime by D tau D tau. And X prime dot, sorry, this is not the notation. D X prime mu by D tau prime is simply by chain rule D tau by D tau prime. So I get one factor of this from here, one from here, one more from here. So two factors of this, one factor of this, they don't cancel each other, so this is not right. Okay. But now we can sort of begin to understand uh, what we should do. Is it, uh, so, so, okay, so solution to this puzzle is that we should give the action 
for a point particle in a curved space time some geometric meaning which is intrinsic which we can say in words and then let's write the equation for that okay now there's a concept of proper distance or proper time or proper length they are all essentially the same it's just a question of sign whether it's positive or negative and the concept goes like this the distance square travel in a space time is by convention minus this so this is called the proper time okay and in flat minkowski space time it's just uh so this will be uh t t yeah, i will be t square minus d x square minus d y square minus d x square okay so and that thing is positive for a physical particle moving along a physical trajectory and as long as the particle has a mass and if it's massless namely it's light then this thing is zero okay so this quantity has an intrinsic meaning for an infinitesimal unit of uh, uh, unit of coordinate separation between two points okay but this quantity is the square of the proper time okay so to get the actual proper time between finitely separated points we must integrate not ds square which we have done here but ds itself okay so the actual proper time so this is the infinitesimal proper time over two very close by points we integrated if you like proper time would be obtained by taking minus g mu nu dx nu dx nu taking its square root and integrating this and this is what as an independent geometric meaning which has no reference if you notice to any coordinate along the world line but it can be written as integral d tau root of minus g mu nu x dot mu and you see that this differs from this by the square root and that's a crucial change okay you must yes so yes yes so right now we are trying to only derive an equation of motion from this action so what constant we put in front is not important but in 2 minutes to give me 2 minutes i will put the constant okay i just want to say that if the goal is to derive a geodesic equation of motion then this action is in good because it doesn't have a proper behavior under changes of the parameter along the world line but this action is better you can see it right away from here that now if i make all these changes i get one factor of this from each of the x dots but there's a square root so instead of two at the end i get one factor of this which is the inverse of this factor which i get from the measure and they cancel so this is actually independent of tau though it has tau appearing in its definition this is exactly the same as this which has no tau appearing in it or alternatively this is the same as what we would write with tau prime instead of tau which means that everybody can agree that this is a correct action without having to agree on the definition of tau okay so that's very good. we are through with that so why is the this square is called proper time sorry the this square is called proper time yeah well it's the proper time square means this is Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So why? Okay. Why it's called proper time is because in special relativity that's the term which is taught to people. What I would like to call it is the invariant distance on this on the Riemannian manifold. Okay. Because distance on any manifold, whether it is a spatial or a space-time manifold, is given if by definition the metric tells us the distance by saying if there's a small amount of coordinate separation dx. then two dxs and the metric together gives me an invariant quantity uh, and what is it invariant under changes of coordinates in the manifold because this infinitesimal length changes by some chain rule and this changes as a second rank covariant tensor and all those changes cancel so what it's called is not important 
Okay. The point is that it's an invariant associated with the trajectory which doesn't care about what coordinates we use for the manifold and it also doesn't care about what coordinates we use along the world line because in fact here there is no reference to any parameter on the world line. We can recast it as something which has a parameter along the world line but in fact this thing is independent of tau because it's invariant under these transformations. Okay. So this is going to be the action. However, now, apart from one detail, which is that we need to fix the coefficient in front, we have another puzzle, which is, are we sure that this action actually reproduces that geodesic equation of motion that we've never shown? And in fact, it doesn't exactly. It's a little bit tricky, so we have to go through that. So first, let's do the constant in front. For that, okay, before that, Okay, let's do that and then let me try to show you one more very compelling reason why these two actions uh, are so different, the one wrong one and the correct one. Why they need, why one of them has to be there and the other is not acceptable. So first let's fix the coefficient. Easiest way is to appeal to a special case. Uh, so my claim, so the coefficient is actually minus m in my conventions. And the way to see that is that if the metric is taken to the taken to be the special case g mu nu equal theta mu nu and if we choose now see, I have convinced you that any choice of property of uh, sorry, or any choice of time parameter tau is okay, right? So I can make a particular choice. The particular choice uh, that's very convenient for physical interpretation is to say that tau and x naught, the zero component of this four vector, are the same thing. X naught equals tau. This is not a choice of x naught; it's a choice of tau. Okay. It says we will parameterize the particle's trajectory by the particle's own definition of time. Okay. It's not a unique choice, it's just one choice. All other choices are equally good because of the invariance of this action. But this is a very nice choice because then the formula becomes square root 1 minus x dot i The term is g0, 0, which is eta 0, 0 is simply 1 and x naught dot is 1 because x naught is tau. Okay? And this should be familiar. Anyway, if you expand this for small values of the velocities, you will get a constant from the 1 plus a half m. And of course, this is the kinetic energy of a free non-relativistic particle which uniquely fixes that the coefficient is m. Here I just call it minus m without proving why I put it there, but this is the proof. Half m x dot squared is the correct answer. Therefore, it should have it should be minus m of z. Okay. <coughs> Let's notice one more property of this action. Any action that you write down, uh, which corresponds to some integral over Lagrangian. Uh, has a concept of canonical momentum, canonical coordinate, canonical momentum, and the momentum conjugate to x is by definition the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to x dot. Okay. And we get two different answers for this if we use this correct Lagrangian or if we use the wrong one that we tried earlier without the square root. And it's very important what's the difference between these two. First, let's do the correct one. So to differentiate this in x dot, it's quite an easy exercise and you get m g mu nu x dot nu over square root of minus So that's the answer. <coughs> okay. Now a special case again is familiar to us. Let's again go back to flat space temporarily, flat space time. In that case, 
we can take this P mu and we can square it. Just multiply P mu with P mu, the contraction being done with the Minkowski matrix, the special relativity. On the right side, we get M squared uh, X dot mu X dot mu over square root square root of minus X dot alpha X dot alpha squared. Okay, so what's this equal to? Minus m square. Thank you. Good. So what have we shown? P square is minus m square. If you evaluate this part in my conventions for the metric, you get P square minus P square is equal to plus m square, which surely in special relativity nobody can argue. With. Okay. This is a constraint in the sense we didn't say anything special about the configurations x. We said any configuration x is okay. Just calculate P, P is this quantity, and we square it and miraculously all the mass cancels out when we square it and we get M square. Okay? That means that this Lagrangian only admits momenta which satisfy P square equals M square. Now you can do an exercise for yourself, I won't do it here, that the Lagrangian without putting that square root up there also has canonical momenta, but they don't satisfy P square equals M square. In fact, the canonical momentum for those that Lagrangian would not have this denominator. Now, if you square this numerator, you don't get you get something. That's all. You get something proportional to v square. Why is it miraculous? You already parameterized that using the proper time. So, whatever comes out should be. Yeah. Okay. You're right. It's not that miraculous. It's still nice. Okay. Good. Now, what's more interesting about this, so this much, you know, every time we appeal to special relativity setting G mu nu equals eta mu nu, we are really doing something that we already know, since we've all learned special relativity before this course. Okay. But whenever we uh, look at these formulae for a general metric G mu nu of x, then hopefully, unless you've studied GR before, we are really doing something new. And what we like to do here is to keep trying to distinguish the case where we are doing something new from the case where we are doing something familiar. Okay? So, this much worked out fine. Now, let's look at the equation of motion when uh, the metric is not eta mu nu, but g mu nu. Okay. Now, it's not that simple anymore because the equation of motion is dl by d x dot mu d by d tau is equal to dl by dx mu. In Minkowski space-time, the right side is zero because there is nothing in the Lagrangian which depends on x. Everything depends only on x dot. Okay? But in general space-time, the right side is there because g depends on x. So we have to uh, carry out this differentiation. And now it's quite a tedious process because on the left side, I differentiate dl with dx dot, I get something, I get p. Now I differentiate p and d by d tau. That means by chain rule, I have to differentiate this part, I have to differentiate this, and I also have to differentiate the denominator. And the denominator tends to spoil everything. So when I do that, I end up with. <coughs> the following Slightly tedious, but it's quite doable calculation, and this is the answer you get. Okay. Now this is not exactly what we were expecting, is it? Okay. We were hoping to have the equation the left side be zero, but instead it's something 
non zero now this is actually has a, so a simple we out of this and a simple explanation of why this happens at this point we can re parameterize the world line remember up to now we have an equation that's come from an action which is invariant under reparameterization tau goes to tau prime of tau so therefore this equation must also be invariant and you can check that in fact the left side is not invariant so the right side also better not be invariant such that the whole thing can be invariant so that's why the right side is there at all okay however we are free to reparameterize the world line by tau prime tau goes to tau prime and in this particular case <coughs> you specify that dt prime d tau prime by d tau is square root of minus so now for the first time we are actually bringing in the proper time in the choice of the tau parameter so we are actually fixing the tau parameter in fact if you integrate this equation it says that the new tau is the integral of this in tau in the old tau and that's the proper tau okay so we are shifting to a very specific tau variable and that means that from this point on we won't be able to reparameterize the world line as uh, as we feel like okay this actually turns out to absorb the rhs that's an exercise for you and so finally we are left with the geodesic equation x that, that we wanted that we guessed to start with but now it's valid only for a class of parameter stuff a parameter term and the name given to this class is a fine parameter and the freedom left after doing all this is to make linear shifts in tau so the remaining the surviving freedom after we have done this is only that tau can go to a tau plus b if we do that then of course you can see that in x double dot <coughs> there's no change okay there's a factor of course d tau prime by d tau is a but second derivative of tau is zero So in fact, this equation is invariant under this limited class of changes of affine parameters. So what we learn is that the geodesic equation in space-time, unlike that in space, is valid not for arbitrary parameters but for limited class of parameters, all related to each other by linear transformations only. So now that we've got the precise derivation, first of all, this is a derivation. I skipped a few steps, but it's a derivation from a particular action, and the derivation comes with the information that when is this thing valid? It's valid for those parameters that you obtain after performing this transformation, uh, and then all others that are linearly related. Yes, we talked about that generalization of the action also for the mass. Ah, massless particle. Thank you. So, of course, the uh, stuff I have done here uh, obviously isn't valid for a massless particle. The action because it has m in front of it and m would be zero. Now, uh, there is a nice way out of it, but it's a little digression which I don't want to go into right now. Hmm? I would like to perhaps go into it some other time. Uh, on the other hand, what's nice is that at the end of the day, you still find this equation. You can still show that this equation. so uh, you could imagine it's not an unreasonable thing to do to think of a massless particle as some sort of limit of a massless particle as the mass goes to zero in quantum theory it's not so good but for this purpose i think you can just do it good okay now we've been working a lot with this abstract computing equation both in space and in space time now and it's interesting or it's very illuminating to consider examples 
So for the rest of this lecture, I am going to do a bunch of examples to show you how geodesics look in space and in space time. And you can generate many more examples for yourself. So the first example will be the only example I will do that's again in the realm of ordinary spatial geometry, doesn't have any time. I'm sure you can guess what should happen with this example. We already written this metric before. So this is the sphere, the two sphere. And it's obtained by taking the metric of three dimensional space in spherical polar coordinates and then fixing r. So you drop the dr squared piece. So now r is not a coordinate but just a constant. So you get a metric depending on theta and phi that describes the true sphere. So far so good. Now we always need to specify the range of values and we will see when we write more and more metrics that range of values of coordinates is very important. Sometimes it will happen that two different metrics can be mapped onto each other by a change of coordinates, but the range of values doesn't match. So if there are subtleties in that, uh, in, in understanding what is the global structure of the space time. So here of course it's easy, minus pi by 2 is less than or equal to theta less than or equal to pi by 2. So theta is equal to minus pi by 2 is the south pole and pi by 2 is the north pole. And phi, 0 is less than or equal to pi is less than 2 pi. We don't put equals here because 2 pi is the same point, that is 0. Okay. So how do I find out the geodesic equation in the most blind possible way? I just uh, look at, I just write down uh, x, I just calculate all the components of the affine connection gamma I or the of the symbol gamma I take it, and I am done. Now that is generally quite a painful procedure, but this metric has a nice feature which is that uh, first of all the coefficient of theta, d theta is just constant. And secondly, the coefficient of d phi depends only on theta and not also on phi. In fact, the entire metric is independent of phi. Okay. So that makes it much simpler and it will make many components zero. So at the risk of boring people who have seen this before, I am going to anyway write down exactly how all the gammas look. So there will be components gamma, theta, 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 gamma, theta, theta, phi. <coughs> gamma, theta, phi, phi. But precisely six that we can think of writing. And four of them are going to be zero and the other two we need. Okay. Now the first thing uh, we can note here is that, so okay, because the metric is diagonal, Remember the definition of gamma has a half g theta and something up there, but that thing has to be the same as the first one because it's a diagonal matrix. So the inverse of a diagonal matrix is again diagonal. So this has to be g theta theta. So far no great surprise, but now we write down the lower this is and we get this kind of structure. But notice that in every term there is a comma theta which means differentiation in theta but uh, it is of the theta theta component but the theta theta component is 1 or it is r squared so it has no derivative in theta so all these terms are 0 and so this is an example that is 0. That clear enough? Okay. If you work this out you will similarly find it 0 but this one is interesting this is half g theta theta. Now the full set of three terms here is g theta phi comma phi plus g theta phi comma phi minus g phi phi comma phi. And now finally something interesting happens. Cross terms like theta phi are of course zero because it's a diagonal metric, but g phi phi is cos is r squared cos squared theta, and that depends on theta. So this derivative will be non-zero. 
Okay. Another thing you notice from here, which is the general property of Christoffel symbols, they are scale invariant under constant change of scale. If I expand the scale of the metric G by a number, then G inverse will decrease by the same number and the two will cancel. If I do it by a function, it does it, then it's a different matter. But a constant number will cancel. So before doing any calculation, I can see that all the Christoffel symbols are independent of R. Okay. So the geodesic equation will be completely independent of the radius of the sphere, which is not very surprising. Okay. Because the geodesic equation tells you how a particle will travel, which is really, really the same for a sphere of this size or that size. It doesn't depend on that. So all little properties that uh, you might find interesting the first time. And so this finally comes out to be minus a half sine theta or minus cos theta sine theta. Okay, so then gamma phi theta theta is also zero and gamma phi theta, okay, gamma phi theta, so phi 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 is also zero because here all the derivatives will be in phi and there is nothing which depends on phi in the so this is zero. This guy is non-trivial. This is a half g phi phi. G phi theta comma phi plus g phi phi comma theta minus. So again, these are zero besides that they cancel each other, but this is non-zero. G phi phi comma theta, uh, but this time there is also a G inverse phi phi which is 1 over cos square. Okay, so this will give me a slightly different answer, and the different answer is tan theta. As we go along, these kind of calculations will become more and more obvious. Maybe they are already obvious to some people, but I think it's good to do it. Most of the reason why this is simple is that the metric is diagonal. It depends on few things and also it's a two-dimensional space. Now imagine doing a general metric in four dimensions. For the, the first thing you would have to do, or even in two dimensions, is to invert the matrix G, which in general, you know, how do you, you, you can invert a 4 by 4 matrix in principle, but try actually doing it in practice. It's not at all an easy thing to do. And then differentiate the components and so on. So it's a pain. So it's good to do simple examples. And here's the simple example, the first one. And uh, it's actually going to be quite illuminating when we do examples in space time. So now armed with these two results, this is one of the gammas, this is another and all the others are zero, we can write the geodesic equation. So theta double dot plus, um, what? Shouldn't it be plus half time difference? Sorry? Gamma theta phi phi. Yes. Should it be plus? This one? Yeah. Should be plus? Uh, if I differentiate cos squared, I get minus 2 cos theta sin theta. Minus 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 minus. Already a minus, then maybe it's plus. So it will be positive. I can never depend my signs. Um, Equations. 
So what do we learn? Well, the most general geodesic on a sphere we already know is a grid circle. Okay. So depending where you point yourself when you start, first of all, all points of the sphere are equivalent. It's a very symmetric space. We'll discuss symmetries of spaces, but in grid you know that. Uh, but if you are at any particular point, if you, are any particular, you have any particular pair of points and you want the shortest distance between them, it's the arc of a corresponding grid circle which wraps exactly around the center of this sphere. So all the solutions of this should be grid circles and that I leave to you to convince yourself. And this should also give you all possible grid circles. But let's look at a couple of facts which will be a little bit illuminating. So one is that if I take examples of solutions, suppose I took theta equals constant. So theta dot is 0, theta double dot is 0. Then phi double dot is 0. So phi is equal to A, B. B. Here I am referring to the parameter as t because this is the actual time because I am doing a spatial example. In space time that parameter will be called tau. Okay? But then to satisfy this equation, this is already 0 by choosing theta constant. Uh, phi dot in general is not 0 so I have to make theta actually equal 0. So on the sphere, what is the locus phi equals a t plus b and theta equals 0? What is theta equals 0? It's just the equator. And phi equals a t plus b is the particle goes down and down the equator in constant time. Now we can also see why we found that theta has to be 0. If theta wasn't 0, then it would be a latitude. These are all latitudes. Theta equals constant is a latitude. But the only latitude which is a geodesic is the equator. On the other hand, if for simplicity we chose phi equals constant, then things are quite different. If phi is constant, then this term is 0, this term is 0, this term is 0, and this term tells me that theta is equal to some a prime t plus b prime, and there is no restriction on the value of phi. So for all possible phi, this curve is a good geodesic. What are these? Longitudes. Okay. So we see in fact quite nicely the asymmetry between latitudes and longitude. Latitudes are not great circles, they are just lines of constant theta uh, in general, and longitudes are lines of constant phi, but longitudes are all great circles, they all pass through the north pole, and latitudes are not unless theta is zero. So all great circles. So it's nice. Okay, this is admittedly the the easiest way to find out the geodesics of a sphere, much easier to just draw the sphere. But it's taught us how to do this, and now we can be brave and try to address some interesting space times. So, the next example I will do for you is called anti dissipate space. Now, sometimes people are careless and they say anti dissipate space, one should say anti dissipate space time. I won't make that distinction too carefully because you can judge for yourself if it's a space or a space time by the fact that the metric has a time like direction or it doesn't. Okay? Now for simplicity I am going to do the two dimensional version. There are many the this space can have any dimension. But uh, again the exercise of calculating twist of the symbols is tedious and it becomes more tedious and we have to find other tricks if we have higher dimensional space time. So let's stick with a two dimensional example. And it's rather pretty because the metric is almost as simple as that of the sphere and in fact it looks very much like the metric of a sphere except for one little, one or two little changes. So the coordinates are rho and t. You can see right by inspection that t is time-like. So the dt squared piece is negative. Okay? 
and the other coordinate, whatever it is, we simply call it rho. We could have called it r. We can call it anything we please. Okay. Now it's actually possible to obtain this from this by some kind of analytic continuation by continuing some coordinates to imaginary values. Uh, that doesn't have any physical meaning, and the geometry of this is completely different from the geometry of this. But it's useful because if you do all that carefully, then you can carry over many formulae from here to here. So, a, so the precise transcription from here is you write theta equals i rho, uh, pi equals r, pi equals t, and also send r to r. So by sending, by replacing theta by i rho, you make this minus d rho square, but r to i r makes it plus again. And here, uh, you get cos squared of rho, and r going to i r makes this term negative, so you get this. Okay. One of the useful things we learn from this fact that you can go from here to here, is that this is a very, very symmetric space. In fact, it has a symmetry group SO3, which is the group of all rotations. Okay. Notice, by the way, that although it's a two-dimensional space, it has three it has three rotational symmetries. That's not uh, something very obvious. The, the plane is a two-dimensional space; it has only one rotational symmetry. But a sphere, even being two-dimensional, has more than two rotational symmetries. In fact, it has three independent rotational symmetries. And it turns out that this also has three symmetries, which are related very closely to the ones of that by this kind of transform. For those who like group theory, the group here is SO3 and the group here is SO2, comma 1, some non compact form. But we are not going to discuss symmetries in any detail now. I just want to try to make this space for you. Now, what do we want to do with this? We want to understand the geodesics of the space. Okay. First of all, uh, maybe I should, just for your entertainment, tell you where this space comes from. Why did anybody think of this space? It's a very logical reason. Uh, why did anybody think of the sphere? Okay, the sphere is the locus of all points at a fixed distance from a particular center. That's a very natural concept which arises in life. Okay, so we think of the two-dimensional sphere by saying we are in three dimensions, and then we have one equation which respects the symmetries of the three dimensions. And so the space is two-dimensional, but it inherits all the symmetries of three dimensions. The same procedure works here. And it works like this. We start with a Minkowski type of space with the metric ds squared equals minus dx naught squared minus dx1 squared plus dx2. This is a three-dimensional space with two time-like and one space-like direction. Okay, we are going to write an equation of some subspace of this space, analogous to the equation for a sphere, and this equation is going to be. Uh, I'm looking at my notes because the signs are always very confusing. This is going to be the equation. Okay. You can see that just as this has two of one sign and one of the other sign, this also has two of one sign and one of the other sign. And that's enough to guarantee that this will have the same symmetries that this space has. Okay. The next step then is to just find a parameterization analogous to spherical polar coordinates, such that by then imposing this equation, uh, one of the coordinates gets eliminated and we are left with the other two. And when I write the parameterization, you recognize that it's exactly what we've done already for the sphere with some of these things being analytically continued. So x is r cos rho cos t, x1 is r cos rho sin t, and x2 is R sin hyperbolic rho. So 
So if I take x0 square plus, m plus x1 square, then this cancels out. Then I subtract x2 square and I finally get r square. So this is correct. And now I have only two coordinates, rho and t. And if I plug this in, it's very simple to obtain the metric term. So this is how you get ADS2 and it's also how you get any other antidecitor space time. Okay. So the important point, I mean, it seems like I just picked it out of a hat and there are many two-dimensional space times I can talk to you about, but it's a highly symmetric space. I just want to emphasize it's as symmetric as the sphere. Okay. But it's a space time. It has a time and a space. So if you think of it just as the space part is just a line, rho is a coordinate that goes, you can see from there that rho should be taken to go from 0 to infinity and t can be taken to be anything positive yeah. no, why would you, you keep put two time coordinates? Sorry? Why would you keep two time coordinates? We don't. It's just a way to oh. get this space. This space has only one time coordinate. It's just a trick, it's a mathematical trick to arrive at this space. There are no two times in this world. Okay. anti -decitor, four dimensional anti decitor space, <coughs> the one that decitor thought about, is just a space, a uh, space time, which has three space like and one time like direction, just like Minkowski space time, just like the world we live in. It has some other features such as a cosmological constant, but that's it's too early right now to worry about. It has only one time. Nobody has two times. <coughs> okay, so the natural range of coordinates here is zero. Rho goes from zero to infinity, and time goes from minus to plus infinity. You could also perhaps take rho to be from minus to plus infinity, but then it would be what we call two copies of antidecitor space, the space Q together. Come on, actually, to take this. Good. Now, what we want to understand is, uh, oh, by the way, there's another space called visitor space, which has a very similar procedure, uh, but it has a very, it has extremely different physics, and its uh, metric is minus dt squared plus cos squared t d theta squared. Actually, the interesting thing about visitor space is that it's time dependent, at least in these coordinates. That means the length scale varies with time. That's not true about anti visitor where in fact the time scale varies with the position in the space. Okay. So these are all very, very interesting and extremely simple examples of phenomena that we'll encounter later on in more realistic situations. This I am not going to discuss in more detail, you can take it as an exercise to study its properties. But what we want to do is to work out the Christoffel symbols for ADS2 so that we can write the geodesic equation. It is hardly any more work than it was for the sphere. And again, you'll find that two of the Christopher symbols are non-zero, gamma rho t t, which is a half sine hyperbolic to rho. I'm feeling I made a ah yeah. Now I think I think my signs are like this. Then. And gamma t rho t, which is than hyperbolic row. It's all quite similar and all the others zero. So the geodesic equations are rho double dot plus a half sine hyperbolic two rho t dot square equals zero and t double dot plus two then I shall go to rho p dot rho dot zero. So these are the geodesics for antidecitor space in two dimensions, 
and again we need to find solutions and there are all kinds of solutions. Okay. It's a bit of a tedious job if you keep working in these coordinates. There are tricks to simplify things. But at least you can be convinced that what we have got is a set of two ordinary couple differential equations of second order. It can't possibly be uh, unthinkably hard to solve them. So they must have some solution. But what's amusing is to look at a few specific solutions and they are there exactly in analogy with the sphere. So one solution is when rho is constant, then p double dot is zero from this equation and from the first equation this goes away so sine hyperbolic 2 rho must be 0 which means rho must be actually 0 and t being having this thing t is eta plus t and remember we are allowed to reparameterize re this affine parameter top so it will be this, it's just the same as saying t is t. Okay, it's more or less what we expect. Now, what does it correspond to physically? Well, rho is constant and rho is the, in fact, rho is zero, and zero is a particular point in the space part of ADS2. So there's a point, the particle sits there for all time. Simply that, it just stays at rest. Perfectly reasonable, geodesic could be one where the particle doesn't move in space, but it moves in space-time, it has a world line, but in the space part it's just sitting in one place. Okay. So this is a big difference from geodesics in space where we always think that to connect two points you better move from one point to another, but these are two space-time points that you are connecting, so depending on which geodesic it is, it can be one where the particle just stays in one place. Okay. Now, is this geodesic time-like or space-like? This is a new question that we couldn't have asked in the spatial case. In space-time situations, a geodesic, like any other curve, can be time-like, space-like or none. Okay. So, this one, now we have to be just a little bit careful because we have to calculate this in the metric that we've written at the top. And that metric, so if we differentiate it with respect to the affine parameter, then ds by d tau squared is r squared minus cos squared rho d dot squared plus rho dot squared. And now we need to know the sign of this guy. So this is of course 0 because rho is constant and this is negative. So we learn right away that this is negative and that is the time like which again makes good sense okay however we also find space like geodesics and they come about by saying instead of rho being constant let t be constant this is funny because t equals constant means we are in space time uh, at a fixed point in time don't seem to move forward in time, so we move in space. Doesn't sound like something a particle can do, and indeed it's not. Okay. But the geodesic equation is not always telling you what a particle can do. We haven't actually figured out yet what dimensions of a particle are allowed. We're just looking at what are the geometric lines along which some trajectory is maximized or minimized, and whatever we find, we find. So we found one kind like geodesic. And we'll find a lot of space like ones because by taking t equals constant, we get this and this and this to go to zero, and rho can be any linear function of the affine parameter. Okay, so this is a geodesic that starts at rho equals zero, if you like, or at any particular point in uh, ADS in the space part, and extends radially along the space part. Okay, I emphasize. It's very confusing to think of two-dimensional space-time because the space part of it is only one dimension. But that's how it is. Okay? And thinking of these examples teaches us uh, the importance of, I mean, these kind of two-dimensional examples emphasize the interplay between space and time. Because in, in four-dimensional space-time, there's a lot of room to move around in space. For example, you can rotate yourself in space. But in two-dimensional space-time, 
the flat case, the only thing you can do is perform one Lorentz boost. Then all the symmetries. Because there is only one direction. So anyway, here are two kinds of trajectories. Now one important lesson that the sphere example should have taught us. Are we to believe that therefore this is the... We found some examples. We haven't by any means found all trajectories. Right? This one is easy to check that it's space time. Now this one is the analog of the uh, longitudes and this is the analog of the equator for the sphere. Okay, we found only one equator and we found infinitely many longitudes. Okay, but what lesson did we learn by finding one equator? Did we convince ourselves that really there is only one geodesic like this? I mean, of course there are infinitely many, just because our coordinates which suggested one uh, in a very easy sort of way to find as a very easy solution of the equation. So, we should believe that this is not the only timeline to basic in ADS2, there are probably many, in fact there are many, it just happens to be one that is very easy to find. Okay? And if there are time-like geodesics and space-like geodesics, then surely you would expect there would be non-geodesics. Uh, and we haven't written those down, but there is a nice way to discover those which I will be discussing another time. Okay? That is a nice, in fact I think it is a theorem almost, in two dimensional space-times you can sort of do everything. These things become much harder as you go up in dimension. But two is very good because we are just ignoring two of the real dimensions of our space-time and working on the other two which are not. Okay. So that is what I want to say for now about the basics of ADS2 and I will conclude in five minutes by giving you one more example of a space-time where we can compute the basics and the space time hides a bit of a surprise. So example 3 goes by the name of Ringler space. Again, it's not a space, but a space-time. And it's actually quite similar to that, but different. Uh, so the metric is minus x squared dt squared plus dx squared. It could have a constant outside, but we don't worry about that. You see that it's quite similar, right? It's the dt squared part is multiplied by a function of space, that is, so it is varying in space, so the time measure is varying in space, but the space measure is constant in time. Okay. Actually, almost without any work, you can guess from this form that the Christoffel symbols are only two out of the possible six Christoffel symbols are going to be non vanishing, and they are gamma ttx, which by identical calculation to all that I have done before comes out this way and gamma x t t is x, all of the zero. That's very nice. Now we see that some things, there are things which might make us nervous. x equals zero is a worrying point because the Christoffel symbol diverges. First of all, what is the reasonable range of these parameters? Time should always be taken minus infinity to plus infinity unless something forces us to do otherwise. Space on the other hand reasonably here you would think is 0 to infinity. Okay. Okay. If you take it from minus to plus you are just viewing together two copies of the same thing. Okay. So it looks like something worrying at x equals 0, we will just leave that as a question. Okay. What are the geodesic equations? x double dot plus x t dot squared equals 0 and t double dot plus 2 t dot x dot upon x equals 0. Now, again, we see some features similar to ADS uh, space-time. For example, 
if time is constant, then we have a space like this, let's say, where x goes linearly in tau. If x is constant, uh, then x should be really easy. Okay, so if x is constant, then this term goes away. Uh, then we could take this term, keep x small and constant, so this term goes away. And then slowly take x to 0, so this term also goes away. And then you have the time like the basic where t goes linearly as a function of tau. So those are both there. <coughs> okay, as I said, we could be a little scared of that point capital X equals 0. But now, so anyway, the equations also, it's also possible and quite easy to integrate these equations in general. So this requires a bunch of uh, tricks which, uh, which you can generally find in books. For example, the second equation is very easily integrated by noticing that t dot is a by x squared. If you just plug in t dot equals a by x squared, you'll find it solve this for any constant. So these are little tricks that, because you can take this to the other side, divide by t dot, so you have t double dot over t dot and x dot over x. So that gives a logarithmic relation and that can be etc. So you'll get the zero. Now this seems to be as much work as that, but it turns out that the space is extremely different for a very fundamental reason, and one way, but not the only way to see it, is to make the following coordinate change. Actually, there's another way to see it, which I'll, which involves null geodesics, which I might do another time. But this one, you can, you can find this coordinate change on Wikipedia if you want it. Just search for linear space. So. You have to think of it, I mean, it's not something that you can easily guess. Um, when I say you have to think of it, I really mean you have to look up. You have to either think a long time or you have to look up something to find that this is a natural coordinate change for the space. Okay. Now, <coughs> under this coordinate change, the original metric ds squared equals minus x squared dt squared plus dx squared transforms. It's a two line calculation. Plug this in, take dt dx, plug it in there and you find the following remarkable answer. That's the answer. So what do we conclude from this? Lindler space is nothing but Minkowski space in some idiotic coordinates. Okay? But it's not also. There's a slight, there's still a subtlety there. But what is certainly true is that if we can do this, and of course here we know the geodesics very well, so we don't need to do all this stuff. We've got this, we've got the geodesics, T and X are linear functions of tau, plug that in and you'll get the geodesics of that guy much more easily than any other. But what you are asking is, why do I want to know anything about that upper space? Well, it's quite interesting and it actually has some physical applications. But I don't have time to discuss that now. But I'll just point out, this, teach, this exercise teaches us a new lesson, which we haven't seen before. At the top I said that t can take any value, but x goes from 0 to infinity. Okay. Now look at this transformation. Okay. If t ranges over minus to plus infinity, what can we say about t by x? Just take time hyperbolic to the other side. Okay? Tan hyperbolic is a function which grows exponentially in numerator and denominator for large x, so it goes to 1, and the same at minus infinity, but it goes to minus 1. So it's bound in between plus 1 and minus 1. So with this transformation, we see that minus 1 is less than or equal to t by x less than or equal to 1. Okay? So we are not getting just Minkowski space, we are getting Minkowski space with a restriction. Let's look at the second thing. The second thing tells us what for x to be a real coordinate, okay, t must be less than x, which means <coughs> uh, t squared must be less than x squared, which means minus x less than or equal to t less than or equal to x and both of these are the same. So both the coordinate transformations carry the same restriction. So what is this? Okay, also the inverse coordinate transformation tells us one more restriction. 
um, the inverse coordinate transformation is nice to write. By the way, it goes without saying that coordinate transformations ought to be invertible, otherwise we are liable to lose information or gain some spurious information when we make transformations. Uh, so the inverse here is that T is equal to X sine hyperbolic capital T and X is equal to X cos T. From this you can easily see for example this direction and by dividing you can also see this direction. But this, now notice sine hyperbolic is a function which is positive and negative but cos is always positive. If cos is always positive and this original x of Ringler space time was positive then small x is also positive. So besides this restriction we also have that x is greater than 0. So if this is what would have been Minkowski space time this one then actually these restrictions tell us that we are only here. In this region, this region is called the Ringler wedge. So it's a wedge of Minkowski space time. So here from this example we learn that a very simple space time with very simple geodesics is actually an even simpler space time, but actually it's a region of it. There hasn't been much physics in this discussion today. I've just been trying to highlight for you the geometry of space-time. But soon you'll see how, you know, first of all, why this example is interesting. You'll see in one of the next few days. And uh, we'll be talking about dynamics of particles, different kinds of particles in these different space times. What happens with this? Wait, this is a Minkowski space of some coordinate. Yes. It's part of a Minkowski space. Yeah, okay, thank you. So I forgot to come back to that. So x equals 0 corresponds, I believe, uh, to x equals t, so it corresponds to these lines, right? Yeah, so that whole, so that's, so one interesting thing is that all values of x equals t, uh, no, am I saying that right? Yeah. yeah, this is x equals t, this is x equals minus t. But now if x is equal to t, then tan hyperbolic inverse uh, of 1 is infinity. So the region won't touch those two lines. Yes, I mean that's that's correct, exactly. So it's the interior of that. But what we learn is that it's certainly it's a okay. The important lesson is this is a harmless point of Minkowski space, right? It's completely harmless in Minkowski space, but the Ringler wedge has this as its boundary. So it's more like the end of the world. We have to worry about what would happen if a geodesic reaches this place. Because a Minkowski space geodesic will just go through it, it doesn't know even about this. But we are in Minkowski metric, but we are in a space where we have ourselves demarcated a boundary which has been inherited from Ringler. So it's a bit puzzling, but it certainly shows us that geometrically nothing can be wrong with the end of it. It's just that the space has an end. Yes? So if we take C to be unity, then this is that the space like. Uh, okay. If we take C, C to be unity. C, the this speed of, speed of light. That's yeah. always unity. Yeah. Yeah. Then if this is just the space like part. Uh, yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. It is just the space. Yeah, well, of course, there could be another one on that side. You could view that to this. That would happen if you have two copies. But you're right. But whatever it is, the point is, Ringler space, all of Ringler space time, whatever is the natural extent of Ringler coordinates, fills only this much of this. So it's like a map where you take this and you unfold it into a big sort of plane of capital X and T by this map. But there you don't know that it's really just this is the boundary. So just just want to show this example now for what it's worth later if we have to study dynamics. Yes. Uh, this is two dimensional, there's no z axis. There's no y axis here. Not that axis. Oh this boundary line. Yes. 